Hello and welcome to the Everyday Hair Colorist, podcast number five. Today's guest is Luke Hersishan. Beloved of the beauty industry, editors and alike, businessman, hair cutter, session stylist, the list goes on. Welcome, Luke. Thanks for coming to spend the day with us today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So as you know, um, this podcast, The Everyday Hair Colorist, it's all about super commercial. And although you don't actually color hair, or I've never seen you color hair, (laughs) your salon group, which you've relaunched, rebranded, is super commercial. Can we talk about that? Yeah, I suppose um, I've never really been interested, uh, and it's not really a judgment, but it's more a kind of where we've allocated us ourselves, I suppose, um, in in the kind of tradey side of hairdressing. Uh, in, in that sense, I mean, we deliberately don't enter competitions um, and we don't tend to do seminars. We don't tend to kind of, um, our like marketing work doesn't tend to focus on the industry. It tends to focus um, primarily on the customer. Um, and that's always been our premise. And that's um, not a judgment in, in that there's lots of amazing brands and, and stylists out there that do spend a lot of time um, educating and doing seminars and all that kind of stuff. It's just not a world that we've ever put ourselves in um, from the kind of show work element, that kind of global stage stuff. We just tend not to do it. So our first, I suppose, whenever we think about anything, it's always about our customer before, probably before and, you know, it's like the beginning, the end of it. We're only ever concerning ourselves about what the customer wants, trying to understand what she might want before she knows what she wants. That's always been our focus. I love that because the reality, of course, is that there are hundreds upon thousands of salons who don't enter competitions or do any of that work and their focus is on the consumer. But I liked what you said about trying to figure out what she wants before she knows it. And it seems like you're really successful at doing that. You are the beauty editor's favourite. Um, they love you. You speak to them in a special way. What do you think that's about? Um, I think, well, when I started, um, there was... Um, hairdressing was very different to how it was now. You had um, the, the the kind of this, this crossover between kind of fashion and, and salon didn't exist um, right at the beginning when I started, which was almost probably just over 20 years ago. Um, So you had um, these kind of very renowned hairdressers. Um, It was like the era of Nicky Clark and Charles Worthington and uh, Mark Hill, um, Beverly Cabela. It was that kind of era of of stylists and they were doing a lot of kind of TV work. And then you had, so that was them over there. And then you had kind of Sam McKnight and Guido and you had all of those guys kind of, it was literally like one was on one corner, one was on the other corner. Yes. And there was nothing in the middle. And we set out kind of deliberately to try and create this uh, point in the middle where actually you could be kind of very much, I hate the word on trend, but you could be very much linked to fashion and still have a very consumer commercial appeal. Our view was that um, hairdressers typically spoke. And if you went around education at that point, it was a lot of language, which I never understood, and I still don't understand it. I get that, totally, Um, yeah. And I almost felt, or we almost felt, that there was like this whole kind of language of stuff that people spoke about um, that meant stuff to them but didn't really mean anything to everyone else. So when I taught, or whenever my dad taught me, it was very much, you know, pull this here, cut that there. It was very visual, and it was very, probably not dissimilar to kind of, you know, the way in which you you work with balayage. It's a very visual... um, aesthetic and it's a very visual way of thinking and and I had this real bee in my bonnet about um I'm slightly going off topic here but I'm just I'll come back to your question in a second but I had this bee in my bonnet about um this kind of um methodical element of of teaching hairdressing which was all good and well to teach basics but actually everyone lost the feeling of haircuts and I think that's I see that when I watch um you do your um your videos and stuff it's so much about um, feeling about whether someone looks great and you can't get that by by only going through kind of um, these kind of rudimentary kind of methodical stages of a haircut or a colour. It's like you just end up with back-to-back highlights or a kind of graduated bob and it's just soulless. There's no feeling to it. Mm. So so 
our thing was like you have to strip away you know technical elements important to to some extent but actually you've got to place as much training on um on how you feel a hair color feel a hair color and so that it really suits that person it's not just painting by numbers or or cutting by numbers right and and, and that the, there was this real feeling so going back to your question which was how do we feel how do we try and how do we understand what women want before they want it and i hope that's what we try and get really good at um is uh, i suppose our philosophy has always been not never to stand still uh, and to try and change what you're doing and i think the only easiest way i can explain it is it's a little bit like fashion you kind of end up wearing the same clothes or the same idea um for a couple of seasons and eventually it's like natural that you you just get bored um, and it's the same with hairdressing. You know, you do. I remember kind of when I started, you know, I found I found straightening irons. We were straightening everyone's hair, and everyone was wearing this kind of geisha like, very, very straight that was hair. Massive. It was ma- it was massive, and it and and I thought, oh, it's I thought it's gonna it's gonna die a death in a couple of seasons, and it carried on and on and on and on. But eventually, and I, I think this is interesting. Beauty editors like to think that trends evolve in in seasons, and they don't. They evolve. I I think you know hair trends. They actually go. On, they evolve over years rather than seasons. So it was always trying to find. So it's incremental changes yeah, yeah. and i think massive one yeah i do i mean by the time people notice it they feel massive but actually what when you're immersed in that you 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 feel it as more of an evolution so um you know just just going back to that kind of straight hair thing um you know you start to get bored of that because you're doing so much of it um it's like you know if you look at kind of the fundamental um trends of fashion you you, we would have gone through kind of and and the kind of clearest easiest one is probably kind of like late 80s early 90s you know huge supermodels uh, massive hair loads of makeup um and what came next it was grunge it was the total opposite and that, that was a huge backlash but it was this idea that everyone was in excess that everything was big and brash and loud and typically beautiful so the obvious way is like a is almost like an opposite i mean we're playing around now with we've got some um some new looks going on our blow drop bar menu um in i think they're hopefully coming out in september um and uh actually for the past five six years it's all been about we've been knocking out haircuts haircuts bobs bobs short haircuts you know it was all that yes and actually we're throwing in um uh, like a 90s chignon which is like so the opposite but only because we have this and we might be wrong we don't always get it right but we have this um feeling that actually maybe you know people are kind of getting bored of it and so it's that natural thing that well if you're so bored i mean just do something that's different. kind of the opposite or or just different and we I mean, don't get it hair accessories right. have become such a big thing anyway at the moment haven't they they're sort of everywhere you go there's hair accessories and i was talking to yep. zoe yeah. on an episode about it so i suppose the chignon really hair accessories and all that they all fit in together don't they yeah i think it's that feeling of maybe kind of styling our hair again mm. um or doing things to our hair again i mean you know I, I, in the kind of 20 odd years that i've been kind of doing it we've gone through um almost like si- a, a full cycle so you, we've gone through like when i started it was like jennifer aniston was like the haircut but actually all the kill kit cool kids weren't really doing that haircut they were kind of just having long hair and it was like about a very very straight flat texture i suppose a bit kind of avril lavigne in that way mm. and so you had this kind of polarized you know camp of um quite a, a very very commercial almost slightly older lady haircut and that jennifer anderson thing or you had the cool kids with like long straight hair and so for years i'd go on shoots and all the girls had long hair and no one and all the agents wouldn't let you cut their hair and you know it was long hair long hair long hair so that's where our kind of blow dry bar came thing came out from because we we thought well, let's just do a load of different ways to style long hair right and then you had this massive backlash and everyone started chopping their hair off and then we've had this kind of bob thick so i just it's almost we're now going i feel like we might go back again into that long hair thing it's like um so back to your thing about um you know accessories it's this just this thing of just getting bored. And so if you're bored with short hair or bobs, you know, clients get bored with that. Can I grow it out a bit? Should we grow it out a bit? And then what else can you do? Accessories are like an easy way to play that up, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, whether it's throwing hair up, where it's a headband, where it's like my mate Sid Hayes did a yes. great pin. Yes. Um, you know, that felt really fresh and modern. So I don't know. I just think it's always just about... Um, 
it's almost just about a bit of rebellion about what you're doing. It's like if you're wearing black the whole time, you might want to decide to, you know, you might get bored with that. It's just that natural, I don't think it's rocket science in a way. I think it's actually quite... Um, if, if you, you give it enough thought, you can... You can crack it, yeah. Try and see something. I think so, yeah. So you're, I think you're known for that really recently, that sort of more textured, messy, sort of mid-length kind of feel to it. And that, that was a push, I thought, against the sort of Kate Middleton kind of hair thing. How do you encourage your team to think about these things? How do you, how do you motivate your team? Because you've got a big team. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Bash your head against the table quickly. Um, I, I think, I don't know, I think um, you try and build, try and get better at recruitment. So you try and build, uh, build the team around people that are into what we're doing. So I think that's kind of one thing that I've learned that if, if you're kind of not on board with us, and I remember kind of three or four years ago, we shed a, a bunch of people that I never, I never felt were totally with, with me. Like, right. um, and so that they're probably more successful where they've gone. We're probably better off without some of those people. And actually recruitment wise is about, you know, go back to the feeling I was talking about before. You really got to feel that, that you're, that there's a, a kind of people are with you because they're really into what the brand. What, yeah, the brand. And I think actually sometimes you're better to sacrifice taking someone on because someone might be super busy, but if they're not on your wavelength, like long term, it's going to kind of cost you. Well, it causes so much disruption anyway, doesn't it? You, yeah. You can sense that sometimes when you go into someone's like, oh my goodness, that yeah. one shouldn't necessarily be there. Yeah. But I think sometimes people are frightened because they could be a moneymaker. Or- yeah. And that's a really hard, I think, as a salon owner, um, I know we certainly went through this, you know, a few times in, in the growing of the business. You know, it's that hard call, isn't it, to make like, you know, do you want to kind of maintain your brand values, which is super important, but at the same time, you've got to kind of keep the business afloat. Yes. Um, so I think, um, you know, we, we've been super lucky. I mean, I think you, you go through that, every brand goes through that, um, and hopefully you come out on the other side. But it's about um, trying to find, the, you know, starting right at the beginning and finding people that are really on the same page. Yes. And, and once you're all on the same page, it's much easier to develop. I think it's when you've got, like, internal disruptors that it can cause a problem. So if you get your recruitment right, yeah. I think everything kind of tends to feel like you're not having to um, kind of ram it down people's throat or you know, drive yourself mad. It should be much more of a natural organic collective as opposed to right this is what we're doing this week and everyone needs to follow the yes i mean i've said to you before i think that whole management thing i think i'd be done for gbh i just can't (laughs) do it i can't i'm just so not good at it it um and i take my hat off to all the the salon owners out there with what they do because it's so difficult cutting great super commercial loved by many where does color fit into it for you how um, do you feel about colour? Well, I, I think I'm a, sometimes a frustrated colourist. Oh, another one. <laughs> another one. Really? Well, yeah. Some people said that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, gro- okay, so kind of growing up, um, not growing up, like when I started, it goes back to the same thing. Like, I had a lot of bees in my bonnet when I started. Right. And one of them was about colour as well. And as much as I got frustrated about the way in which hairdressing was taught in this country... Um, which I know is a probably quite a controversial thing to say because you've got millions of people say, oh, British hairdressing is the best thing in the world. And I thought there was... It, a- is, it is if you're in the right salon, but it's, I, don't, I think a lot of us would agree that the MVQ isn't so, or hasn't been so great, and it's just been changed again. But, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it was... It, my, my issue back then was that everything was so... Was so um, I'll, 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 I'll rein myself in a little bit, but, but my issue was that everything was so methodical, there was no room for kind of feeling um and, yeah. I, and i think that came across a lot in color as well because you know we were teaching people um you know how to do a perfect set of highlights and i think that i remember, i'll never forget i was on a i was on a shoot probably when i was about 23 it was for arena on plus which was like um like a men's style bible at the time i think it still is to some degree it was with a huge photographer called david sims who i was like lucky enough to work with um for a few years uh, and he wanted to create. Uh, we had a guy who was like a, one of the um, one of the guys uh, that was kind of on exclusive for Dior with um, Hedy Slimane at the time, and he wanted to do this kind of 
colour that was like three colours. was red, green and blue. And he wanted it to look like it had been like it like it was done six months ago. Right. And 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 I, as a non colorist, found that really easy to understand how you would do it. But uh, you know, to me, I was get it in the basin, throw the bleach on with your hands, just pull all the combs away, put the foils away, put the sections away, and just whack it on. Right. And I and I had this colorist at the time who was. Who was, a weaving, who was weaving and, 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 and foiling and, and I was and oh, the roots and I was like, this is going to be, he's making this worse, you know, because we're going to have to, we're going to have to die out this root <laughs> one way or the other, yeah. because I know it's not what he wanted. And I, and I think that this is the problem a lot of the time when you, when you're so, when technique is so ingrained in you, uh, but in a way where there is no, uh, Room for manoeuvre. Yes, and and that was the problem, and, and so I always got frustrated because at the time, you know, I color the coloring that I loved, or I'd go on a shoot with a photographer, would be like, I love the fact that she looks like she's been in California for six months, right? I mean, this was like fifteen years ago, right? Yeah. And and getting colorists to do that was like pulling teeth at that point. That is quite hysterical because, of course, you know, fifteen years ago it was full on in the States with that kind of look anyway. Yeah. You know, that sort of yeah. lived, in, yeah. lived in hair, which is so now yeah. everyone tries to do it. Yeah. But when I first came back to the UK, there was this sort of wall of, like, no, we foil in England. <laughs> we have these perfectly sea of placed foil highlights. And it's just, there's something nice about imperfection. Oh, tell me about it. I mean, that, that, that I remember, I, and I remember, you know, and we were guilty of that as well. I had colourists at that point going back to that whole point about people that shouldn't have been mm. with us and, and eventually, you know, they, they weren't with us. But I had, um, at that point, had a, an Australian colourist with us called Lindell um, Mansfield. Oh, I know. And, 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 and we met backstage at uh, shows, assisting, and we helped sponsor her and get her into the UK. And she was amazing. She came in with a whole, you know, we were like, we were like one voice, you know. She yeah. could do a route, she could do a you know, grown out highlight or gr- whatever you wanted to call it. But, you know, that then, you know, in a sea of colorists that were just doing back to back foils was just like. All the, perfectly it was like, folded and wrapped. Yeah. And it extra was, wrap around them. Like, I'm never sure what that extra wrap is for. <laughs> <laughs> but that was like, shout that was like war. That was yeah. like, you know, and no one wanted, it was so hard to break that down. And I think, um, my, my, my thing about color was always like, why does it have to look colored? You know, that was, and I suppose now we're in such a better place from a commercial perspective you know that is much more readily available much more achievable the education probably thanks to people like you has done masses for the industry and for kind of moving people's minds on but this is what frustrates me is that is that for a long time there was and i think instagram's probably helped massively as well instagram's hugely helps but we'll talk about that in a second okay um <laughs> you know it's just that that wall of like you can't do it like this you know this is that i i think this, like any industry, if it doesn't move forward, if it doesn't progress, if it doesn't allow people to think and challenge, it ends up um, kind of eating itself. Yes. I remember that um, I had a hashtag that was foils are dead when I came back to the UK. <laughs> and it drove Everyone people mad. bonkers with yeah. it. But I just, I even laugh now, like you could do, I, when I'm teaching a balayage class and I'll say to people... Don't get your tape measure out. It doesn't need to be symmetrical anywhere except at the front on the face frame. And I'm like, it's about balance, so just look at it. And people Mm. really struggle with that. It's really funny you say that because um, one of the things I'm known for when we when we when we about to put people on the floor um, and they're kind of towards their end of their um, their end of their training, and I confiscate their combs. (laughs) And I go, do the haircut without a comb. Oh, my goodness. Pick, pick you know, get your hands um, and your razor or your scissors, whatever it is, and just start doing it by feel. And it's amazing how much... I mean, it's exactly the same. You know, it's the, it's the same idea. Yes. Um, take a bit off here, take a bit off Yeah, and there. look, use the mirror. I yes. mean, the amount of people, and I'm sure you see it with colour as well, um, and I see it with colourists, um, and it's frustrating, and it's the same with haircutting. You know, they don't look at the person. And not looking at in the mirror, it's just it's cutting by numbers or painting by numbers, mm. and that was always what we was trying we were trying to bash out. It was like, do you think the person sitting in front of you looks younger and better and fresher than she did beforehand, or is it just all joined up and perfect? Like, which one do you want to tap yourself on the shoulder with? You yes, know, I love that. Um, and I want to tap the one on feels younger, fresher, 
and yeah. relevant. Yeah. I mean, I used to say terrible things to them, like, do you fancy her more now than you did when you said you came in? Like, I mean, like, you know, it was just trying to get people to feel. Feel. Because any, I think you can teach anyone to cut a straight line to I think, some degree. I think you can teach anyone to put a foil highlight in, yeah. to be honest with yeah. you, yeah. if it's just regimented. Mm-hmm. But when you start thinking about placement, which is feeling, so you can have feeling in a foil. Absolutely. That, that, yeah, that, yeah. I, I think it's that thing, isn't it? It's just like thinking about where that foil should be, right? Yes. As opposed to like you do five here and ten there and the back to back and da da da, and it just becomes. I mean, I, I think to some degree it's like job satisfaction links into all that as well because if you really feel that you've made a massive difference, um, some like the result should be way more satisfying than. Just the process. Just doing it. Just doing. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, I used to see a lot of hairdressers get very kind of bored and I want to, you know, there's a lot of, I want to do session work. I want to do this. And I'm like, but you can make salon work really exciting. And that's why I never gave it up Hmm. because I, 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 you know, I used to go on assisting on shows and everyone was like, oh yeah, I'm bored of the salon. I just want to work on session. And I was like, that's really, that's a shame. I used to really... Um, make my blood boil a bit because I felt like I watched my dad, you know, do amazing haircuts and he was like my biggest inspiration because he would just change what he's doing every six yes. months. It's that thing of like, why, it doesn't just have to be cutting Mrs. Blah Blah's hair and, and it's a trim and, you know, that it was all the wrong mindset. It was actually, we can make this really, really great. Yeah, absolutely. And you can make a ton of money mm. behind the chair if you're a successful salon stylist or colorist. Mm. And it doesn't have to be by numbers at all. And it shouldn't be by numbers. And you should feel joyful yeah. about it. Yeah, oh, I agree. And you can see that. You can see people who are joyous about their work. Yeah. And then the ones who are, you know, scuttling off to the staff room, a cup of coffee, I need my break kind yep. of thing. You can see that. Yeah. So we briefly hit on Insta, mm-hmm. which has totally changed the playing field, I think, and has allowed hairdressers up and down the high street and, you know, in the village and whatever, to be, to sort of break all those rules that we were just talking about and say, oh, no, I don't have to do it that way. I can do all of these different things. And colour's just a really exciting time at this moment. So what about your colourist now? Um, so I think, you know, as a, as a colouring team, I think they are... Um, I, th- I think it's it's much more democratic for them now. I, I'm like I think when we started, it was like you really had to fight to get noticed. You had to fight to get an editor to write about you, and that would kind of build your following. It's now like everyone can do it. I mean, they've ninety percent of my team now have all got a profile to some degree. I think some of them have been a bit slower off the back. Some yes. of them were quicker. Um, on that though, sorry to interrupt you. On that, your team have a profile. Mm-hmm. Are you? quite controlling about no. what they put on their, no. their gram no. or do you just let them be free with it? I think that um, if you want to if you want to get a bunch of disgruntled if you want to have a disgruntled team you'll control their Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I think like um, you know I, I, and I, I actually I listened to um, I think it was Sophia Hilton I, I think it was her it was a podcast she was doing a while ago and I remember her saying like that the, the salon owners that were so scared of Instagram that wouldn't allow their team to do it are the ones that probably ended up with like people walking out. Yes. I think you, you know, so we've always made a, a couple of like kind of Guidance. headliners for, from us was like, we, we never wanted our brand to just be about myself and Daniel. It was always about growing the team. Yes. Um, we've had great bunch of people go through the ranks, leave, set up their own businesses. And that make, to us, I think that makes us, um, helps us, it elevates us as well. So, Absolutely. So, so, you know, and you know who those people and, are, yeah. right, and they've grown really well. Yeah, I, you know, and I think that's that's great. We're super proud of that. Um, we've got a next generation of people growing up through the ranks and they're doing it in a, in a, in a different way, and I think Instagram plays a huge part in that. Um, and, and, and I think all we can try and do is be a mentor for them and be there for advice. Yes. Um, you know, we hold sometimes... Um, little brainstorms about how we can help them. We bring um, speakers in to talk about how they've been, how they've built their profiles. So, you know, it's something that I think um, some of our team that were kind of um, uh, found found more uh, difficult and challenging because they, they were perhaps a little bit older. Um, we, we just tried to make it less intimidating and tried to show them 
um, you could try it like this, you could try it like that, and let everyone find their own way. But I don't believe in in in, in controlling in controlling them because it just flies in the face of what Instagram and social media is supposed to be about. about. Yeah. 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 It's supposed to, you're supposed to have a, a feeling. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're supposed, yeah. To get, you're supposed to get a feeling for the person. Yeah. It's funny we're talking about feelings today. It, when, when I started, you, you, you went to Covent Garden and bought yourself a portfolio and you had these little acetate sheets in it and you collect your tear sheets and, you know, that was your portfolio and you, it was yes. only, only seen by the people you showed it to, agents or, you know, when you're trying to get work. You know, the, the beauty of Instagram is actually it can become your portfolio. You don't need anything physical um, that, you know, um, and, and I see it done in a multitude of ways and I think that's what's really nice. You know, we've got a couple of guys um, with us, Nick and Sean, they call themselves the Hair Bros. They're up for... Um, yes, hit, congratulations. Hit um, thank you. They, they, so, so they both were kind of ex-assistants of mine. They're on the floor. They um, they do a great job of kind of documenting how they feel about haircuts. Um, they do a lot of video and they do a lot of kind of long-form stories. And I think that format is not something that I necessarily see everywhere else. So I think it's a really about making it your own, like how it, you know, because you don't want to see the same page over and over again. No, you don't, but you, but you do. Yeah. In the sense of there's a lot of that, isn't it? It's the same, it's the same blowout. It's the same it's Irish the same dancer hair yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, as Dylan Bradshaw calls it, that's yeah. why, you know, but um, <laughs> I've watched those guys and they, they video and they cut and they talk about it as they're yeah. going through it. And it feels quite raw. Yeah. Um, and it's, but it seems very professional still. Yeah, I think um, it's great because I think um, what they're doing is kind of talking about why they do things. Yes. And, and, and I go, and to me, that makes me super proud because that was kind of what we're going all the way back to the beginning we we're talking about. Um, it's not about, to me anyway, and for our brand, it's not about perfect looking, you know, when I say perfect looking shapes, I mean like totally graphic, you know. Um, no one could spot a millimetre difference. It's not about that. And, and mm. it's about celebrating the imperfections. Um, and then they'd be the first to admit that they can't do the most perfect looking graduated Bob, but that's not what they're about. Um, and so I think that they're edging a, 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 a kind of profile for themselves out that's um, really uh, authentic to what they're about. Yes. Yeah, I liked it. I like, I like watching them. Thanks. It's quite good fun. Yeah. But I mean, my, my friend Arne in LA, he doesn't cut a straight line anywhere do you know what I mean yeah. so you, do, yeah. you don't need a straight line not at the moment and, no. and I think you know that might change tomorrow and and and, and, that, and it might become all about that straight line again yeah. yeah I mean my dad's great to talk to in that sense because he's been through so many different iterations you know he started in the early 70s he was doing 12 wedges a day at one point yes um, he was doing you know I really, love my really, wedge yeah, <laughs> <Loved> <laughs> he was doing all those kind of very, very technical haircuts. Yeah. And now he 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 basically only uses a razor. So it's about changing, and I think to have longevity, it's about um, it's about saying I'm a sponge. I'm going to soak everything up, and I'm going to keep moving, keep changing. Because I think that's where I see people's career not not last. They get stuck in a way, and, and they don't change, dated. and it becomes dated. So yeah. I think that's the biggest like. That's the biggest danger. It's the biggest lesson one should be, like, really aware of. I think if you're doing the same thing in the same way as when you trained 20, maybe even 15, 20 years into it, you must be really bored. By yeah, it. totally. It's, I, I agree. It's like swiping food through the checkout at uh, Tesco's or something, I think. You know, yeah. Mundane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's what you have to be tough on yourself to keep changing, keep challenging yourself. But... You know, one of the things I learned was that the reason a lot of people don't change is because they're actually genuinely scared. Yes. Um, and, and I come across a lot of that. People don't want to change clients, don't want to don't want to change what they're doing because they fear that the client's going to hate it and they're never come back. And I said, well, well, think of it like this. Think of it as that if you always this, say this to say this to you know guys just on the going on the floor, I say um, if you give that person a trim, what's memorable about it? Mm. You, the experience like the salon okay fine but they can get that anywhere and it'd probably be a lot cheaper they're only coming to you for an opinion right and and that's the biggest thing you can get you can give someone and and and, and justify the the price that you're that you're charging and and i say you know if you're if you're happy to just um to just keep trimming that person 
and she's going to go somewhere else anyway. So because there's so, going to be a moment where because, she's at home and she doesn't feel fantastic. Because you're not the person to give it to her. Yeah. Uh, because you've never suggested anything. So stop being scared of changing that person. Um, because whether she likes it or hates it, if you carry on, you've got a bigger, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is you've got a bigger, bigger um, chance of her coming back and recommending 10 of her friends if you take that risk and change her than if you keep, if you keep just doing the trims. Yes. She's probably going to go somewhere else anyway. What I've noticed is that people are frightened of the client kicking off. Hugely, yeah. Hugely. Yeah. And, I mean, it is quite terrifying when a client kicks off yeah. anyway. You know, it's just like, <laughs> oh, God, not again. Not, that's five times this week. Um, <laughs> so it, but it's hard, isn't it? Because I think in this Instagram age, mm-hmm. of course, people's expectations are absolutely massive now from whether it's going out for dinner or everyone's got an opinion. Everyone feels that they, they know more or they're better. And then people come in, of course, with, it used to be a magazine. Now it's an Instagram page and it's like, you can't copy it. it you can make a feeling mm-hmm. of it or mm-hmm. something similar mm-hmm. or your feel on it, your mm-hmm. vibe. You know, I can't do your work. You can't do my mm-hmm. work, but mm-hmm. we might be able to do something mm-hmm. similar on, on a taste level. How do you encourage your team to manage expectations of clients? Um, okay, this is a really good question. Um, it's probably I, a long one as well. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, it's, it's similar to what I was saying before. I think um, we really try and ingrain it into the team that, you know, we're, we're, we're lucky. We're kind of situated at the kind of top end of the market. We charge more, you know, our price our prices are, are be higher than most and yes. so therefore it's a an impetus to stop um kind of resting on our laurels so it's about what are you doing for this hundred plus pound ticket yes. that they that they can't get somewhere else so we really drill it into people that that it, it's all very well having a nice experience um b- being pleasant to people having a chat uh being a good person but actually you've got to give the opinion and and it's the opinion that we that we drive into people it's about we try and train them that you've got to take the risk early right so you've got to take the risk early in your career you've got to get used to that because actually ultimately it all boils down to confidence um you've got to get your confidence up and the best way of taking of getting of getting your confidence up is by taking as many risks as possible and it, you know if you get the if you don't take those risks that idea of taking a risk becomes bigger and bigger and bigger in your head. So it's about standing behind that chair and saying, I think you should have this. I think you should have that. You know, it's about putting it across, even if you're not executing it, but just standing there and saying, I think this is what we should do. I think that's actually, you want to be, I always say to them, you want to be the guy or the girl that, that, that people are coming to and go, what do you think? Because I think that um, people go into salons and like the default position is, because they don't know. Most people don't really know what they want. They go, just, just a trim. Right. Oh, just to top up the roots. And, 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 and what you've got to read beyond that. You've got to go, well, okay, it's just, well, that's fine. But actually, what's your dream here? Tell me. Like, what, what do you really want? You know, I, I, I say, we say to the team, like, spend as long as you want doing consultation. Because actually, a lot of our haircuts <laughs> don't take very long. Right. But it's getting it right. It's understanding what people want. Like, talk to them. So I use dream hair. I use what's your, what's your dream, what's your... And I think it's a really good one because it allows a woman a, a moment to talk about really what yeah. her ideas. Yeah. Because I, I kind of feel like if she's got a vision, let me figure out what that is mm-hmm. and let me see whether it coexists with my vision. And somewhere in there, we will find a truth. Mm-hmm. Um, it's It's... I think it's the consultation that's like make or I, I say to them, you can make or break that client consultation. Yes, it's 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 to me it's as if not more important than the than the carrying out of what you're doing because if you get that person on the right wavelength before they've even you know had the hair washed or you pick up a comb or a foil or whatever that is, yeah. they will relax. Their body language will relax. They will enjoy the next two hours rather than sitting there like a dentist chair, clutching the chair, panicking, <laughs> terrified because they're not sure. I always say. Yeah. Don't talk technically, talk visually. Show them how short, how long. Is it blunt? Is it soft? Is it, let's use words that... that and that's the consumer. That's consumer talk, mm. isn't it? Don't, mm. don't, I always say to the guys, leave your numbers 
yeah. in the dispensary <laughs> and come out and talk food or talk yeah. fabric or yeah. talk something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But don't start talking numbers. Yeah. Um, I even like sometimes hear myself kind of um, rewording colour consultations because I still don't think that women really understand what warm is to some some degree. You know, warm to a colourist is kind of not necessarily warm to um, the person in the chair. No, I think that clients understand orange and red. Yes, totally. No, yeah. I don't want any orange in there. <laughs> totally. Know. That's a brunette for you all the yeah. way, isn't yeah. it? So, yeah, I mean, warm, you can still get something warm that's neutral. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But warm to you, but neutral to the client anyway. So yeah. Just think. So, consultations, key. I think that everyone that's been on here has, has said that. And I think that the industry, we're seeing more on Instagram about brands little company brands, big companies, talking about the importance of a consultation. Do you charge for yours? No. Not at all? No. Why is that then? It's never even crossed our mind to charge okay. for them. Um, I don't know. I just think it's hard enough to get people in the door, in the chair. Mm. Um, I think it's um, your... Um, you can woo someone with a consultation... Absolutely. Um, you can you can plan an entire um, look change um, through a consultation. Um, why charge for it? You're putting another barrier up um, for people to uh, to have to break down. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's um, I can't. I just can't. Yeah, I can't see. Can't, I can't, can't do that one. I can't do that. One. I can't do see, that. what I found about it was that what it did was it. So I charge for it, but then it's redeemable against the service. Okay. But what I found was I no longer had time wasters and people not showing up, which just so frustrates me. The last thing I want to be doing is sat Okay, around. so we've done... Okay, this is really interesting if we divulge slightly off this for a second because okay. I think um, it's a really interesting point. I think the no-show element is huge. We, we've done... Um, well, I'm super proud of what we've done over the past three years. We've developed a system... I'll, I'll go back a little bit further. So we, we've used a computer software, yeah. one of the big ones that probably a lot of people have used, very frustrated with their online booking. It's a terrible experience for customers, right? Um, and it doesn't have the ability to take credit cards. So um, automatically we're open, widely open, for people to book appointments and not show up because yes. they don't place the value of your time as much as they place their time unless they're actually paying for it. Yes. So I take your point, yeah. you know, having the idea of... A, of, of, of um, of, uh, of charging for that when, when you can have lots of no-shows is a huge problem. So we developed um, ourselves um, a piece of kit that sits on our existing booking software that takes uh, a credit card detail um, from the customer when they're booking um, and then sends them an email reminder and a confirmation of what they're booking uh, with a 24-hour cancellation period. So if they cancel within that 24 hours, then, then the whole uh, fee is debited. Um, but it stops the no-show. Um, yes. we, we were we were suffering huge no-shows until yes. we put that in a couple of years ago. So it's kind of got rid of that whole... So they are basically paying a deposit. Well, we don't they turn up, they get charged for exactly, the appointment. Exactly. So, yeah, so we don't, you know, so... It, it, Maybe it's a little bit more subtle than mine. It, 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 it's probably a little bit more subtle. And I think, you know, especially our guys just going on the floor that have got, you know, time to kill that, you know, um, would be sitting... Anyone sitting in their chair with an opportunity to convert into a haircut is a blessing. Yes. Uh, there's lots of salons in London. Um, oh, and I think, you know, everyone has to work really hard to um, to get people in the chair and to make them love them and to tell all their friends about them. I think yes. things are, you know, uh, 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 could always be easier, right? So the no-show problem is it has been a huge problem, but I think we've totally dealt with it. Mm. Um, and I'm super proud of what we've built. Uh, it's a great piece of kit. And do you do that for, like, just out of interest, do you do that for just new clients or do you, you do, do it for, for anybody? Everyone. So, for everyone. you know, on a Saturday when somebody rings up at sort of five past the hour and says, oh, I'm not going to come today or something. And I'm just like, really? I, had, I mean, I had one on Saturday because I don't take a deposit for a regular appointment do you find it cures most of that yeah it's cured 85 90 percent of it that's brilliant um it was a it was a struggle uh so we stuck we, we put the kit in our blow dry bars to start with right and um, trialed, where we it. trialed it where we were suffering the most i mean our, one of our stores in selfridges was losing about four thousand pounds a week on no shows wow that was a six chair blow dry bar Wow. So that eradicated that. And then once we got it right in the blow dry bars, we put it into the main salons. 
Um, and, you know, that was harder because it's got a, a, a very, very loyal existing cl- client base. Yes. Um, and, you know, there was a bit of resistance. Oh, I don't want to give my card details and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it settled down. And I think the stylists are on board with it. Colorists are on board with it. Um, but it took time. You know, it wasn't, it's not an easy piece of kit we to to develop. And it right. wasn't an easy kind of political decision to make. The thing is, restaurants do it, doctors do it, everyone does it. So I mean, yeah. Well, why? that was that was always our point. You book um, you book a you book a restaurant, um, and you give credit card details, as you said, a dentist, the same thing. You know, Absolutely. why should hairdress? Why should the hairdressing industry be treated any different? Exactly. We need to make sure we we bring our game up. I think. Yeah. So not only an accomplished businessman and hairdresser and talent and all those things. Also, a writer of books, which I loved that book. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. But you've gone into products. Yeah. Um, so this was a, a first for us. So as I said, I've, I've been working with my dad for about 20 years. Right. Um, he's been in the industry for about 45 years. We've never, ever done a wet product. We've done tools, yes. extensions, yes. bits and pieces. Um, and the reason for that really was um, when all the kind of celebrity hair care was flying high in the kind of late 90s, Charles and Nikki and Umberto and, and all those guys, uh, we felt that we didn't really fit um, with that crew. We felt like we were doing something kind of different. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we kind of held pause on it at that point. We started going into tools. We were the first people to do professional straightening irons before GHD ever came out. And that was... You know, super successful and probably my biggest regret that we never kind of capitalized on that like we should have done. Mm. So you do learn from your mistakes. You um, really, really do, believe yeah, me. Yeah, that was a big one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, the, the the reason we've done Almost Everything Cream, uh, which has just come out it's about a month ago, was, was a kind of response to um, the fact that there was just so much stuff. Now, I, well, we as a brand have never been like huge styling product people. I mean, I believe in care and I believe in kind of paying for care. And I think that you can clearly see the difference between, a, a, you know, a Kerastase and a, and a kind of, you know, boots over the counter um, shampoo and conditioner and yes and i think care when it's targeting specific issues is really worth investing in so i heavily believe in that but i talked a lot in the book about um about my kind of irritation really about um about the the wastefulness of product and how much stuff there is out there um i learned a lot of this um a couple of ways so we we started selling our hair pieces into sephora in europe and we were in about eight countries at one point and every couple of months, they were like, we need something new. We need something new. What's new? We need newness, newness, newness. And in the end, it became about um, newness for the sake of newness. So they just wanted stuff to talk about. And they did that through new product launches. And I'm sure a lot of us will see this through a lot of the big, the big companies out there. You'll see a new styling product come out. And then six, nine months later, you'll never see it again. It's off the shelf. And actually what I started realizing was people are doing product for the sake of doing product with a different name, a longer formulation, a bigger claim, et cetera, et cetera. And and I think that, well, our thought process around all of this was that actually what you're going to end up with in the long term is disappointed customers. And we started investigating a lot into this and found that every woman that we spoke to had a drawer or a cupboard full of these half used products um, that basically went to that drawer to die and they never got touched again because they never understood how to use them and they let them down on what they were promising to deliver, you know, bigger, fuller, thicker, longer, blah, blah, blah. Right. And it was all this over, over-promising so true, and over-delivering. And it really kind of riled us because a lot of it was becoming really quite expensive as well. And we've always been about the haircut and the colour and then, you know, our whole thing was like, you just need a little bit of this or a little bit of that and you don't really need this whole routine of like eight products to get a result. Um, it was kind of irritating that you read this and you just knew it wasn't true or that product companies were saying you've got to do this, you know, six or eight steps to get what you want. Um, and so, you know, we've always been about the couple of things that, yeah, that we need. Key. The key things. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and really what we did was I used to carry around um, probably six little black boxes in my kit. My kit's four cases wide, big. And, um, and I had these four or six 
bags of product. I never used this product ever. But you always took it. It was with like you. a security blanket. Right. So I'd have four waxes and three mousses, and you know the list went on and on and on. And in the end, I realised. I was talking to a couple of my team. I said, "It's funny because whenever we actually go on set, we take Elnet and we take an oil and we take a cream uh, and some dry shampoo, and that's basically everything else stays in the bag." Yeah. And so it all started making sense because actually we thought. Let's just do one cream that does all the things that I use these kind of two or three products to do. Now, it's never going to be Elnet, it's never going to be a hairspray, and it's not a volumizer. Right. But basically... It can do everything else. It can kind of do everything else, and it's a tenor. And, and I think it's honest, and it delivers on what it says it can do, uh, and I feel kind of immensely proud of it because it's, it, it feels true to, to what it's meant to be. But I think there's just too much stuff out there at the end of the day. And it's brilliant. Um, and the, trying to streamline everything, make your cupboard cleaner, make your yes. house cleaner. Like, make your bathroom cleaner as well, not having so many things in it. I mean, yeah. my bathroom is just full of everything. It was a cream that's promised me that, that never delivered. <laughs> you know, and everyone's always trying to sell me an eye cream and something else, and I'm like, I don't need it. I just want, you know, yeah. to cleanse my face with and a moisturiser yeah. and something to wash my hair with and something to condition. It's funny, there's been a lot of data that's come out since that apparently talks about how we're, we're entering into this... Um, to this era of kind of streamlining things yes. about making things cleaner and simpler and um hopefully that you know if we've got that right and that's where people are thinking about anyway and we're thinking about that then hopefully you know it's done really well today and hopefully that will feels brilliant when you do it to your wardrobe when yeah, exactly. you clean it out exactly. and you yeah. get your key items there it feels great when you clear out a cupboard why wouldn't it feel great just to have a couple of things just to use yeah declutter your hair wardrobe declutter your hair wardrobe <laughs> that's a really interesting one great stuff Instagram, mm -hmm. taking photos of clients in the salon. Uh -huh. Is it a yay for you or a nay? Do you find it difficult? How do you get your pics? Um, so it's a funny answer because uh, it's, it's definitely a yay um, from me on it. Um, it's funny because we did a Q&A with some of the guys in, the, um, in, in, in Harvey Nichols the other day and um, it came, this question came up. Um, now I don't do it myself and only because, um, from an Instagram point of view, I, I have a feed. It's not as active as it should be. I place probably all my effort into, into overseeing the Hirschson's feed, yes. which is very active. Um, and so, um, I, I don't know if I, if I necessarily, um, do that much myself, but I think the premise that I've kind of spoken about is that I think, and we, we were talking about this with a couple other guys the other night, the other day, um, is that you know in a chair when you feel like it's right to ask or a no go, and I think you have to check in with yourself mm. uh, and make that call as to whether you think it is the right thing. I think on the on the plus side, I think if you were asked if you could be in a video or someone could take a picture of you for any form of publication, you would only. I think most of the people I know would only feel flattered, and so I think that's always the advice I give to the team: is like actually. It's quite flattering to be asked whether you, whether the client wants to say yes or no is is a different thing, and I think you need to judge that at the moment. But I certainly wouldn't um, I wouldn't talk people out of doing it. I think it's only a positive. Look, we all need more and more content, whether yes. that's for our whether that's for our feed or the salons feed or, or or a brand. It's we're in an era of you know trying to create as much content as we can, as much good content as we can. Absolutely. I mean, I spend a day, sort of my Fridays, um, I sort of do my press and try and do the influences there and all that stuff and, it's, and get images going from that. But I, sometimes I'm just too busy to be taking a picture. Do you, plan your, um, do you plan your kind of schedule? So you know, I'm doing this over the next week and I'm going to try and get a story here or a grid there. And I think that, you know, people don't... Some people plan it, some people... I don't plan, unless I'm going away. If I'm, like, if I, when I go off to, you know, to detox or something then it's, it's planned. Um, but usually it's, again, it's a feel, it's how I'm feeling. Yeah. So maybe the night before I might be thinking about it or the next one, or I might have a few lined up, ready to go. But generally it's just the conversation I feel like having that day. So, you know, I had a, a grid of three foils the other month and everyone's like, have you gone back to foiling? And I'm like, no, I was just playing around with it. I wanted to mm -hmm. see what I could do with a hairline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, I don't, do you plan yours? Um, we plan Hershesons. Yeah. Um, so we kind of know 
we try and get to five stories a week and two to three grid posts. So we plan yeah. it in that sense. And I've got a great um, digital um, exec who, who works with us who um, helps actually um, create the content with the team. Right. Um, so we, we plan it in that sense. But um, I probably need to plan mine more because um, I, I, to me, it's just a timing thing. You know, I, I find it, it's not... Um, the most natural thing for me to do it. Um, so I have to be quite strict with myself. Yeah, I found it a little bit... I, I felt it was being boastful when I was on it. And then I just had to push that to one side and just like, you know, you need... you want to put, I want to put like a clear message of who I am, what I do. And I decided to just stay on it. And it's been good. It's funny, isn't it? It's like... Um, I think we come from a generation where, where we're a little bit afraid to kind of shout about... Um, what we're doing and as you said you know you don't want it to come across as boasting yes uh but actually it, there's that line isn't it between actually this is who i am and what i do yes it doesn't have to be about it doesn't have to be no, boastful agree. and i think even if somebody's boasting i mean fine good on them yeah I mean. well thanks so much luke you might be late luke because <laughs> he was only half an hour late for this appointment disaster morning but he's definitely one shot luke thanks for having me no it's an absolute pleasure thank you so much really fun really conversation good. really interesting thank you So I hope you enjoyed this podcast as much as I did making it for you. Don't forget to subscribe on your channel that you download your podcast from. iTunes is my favorite, but I know there are others out there. And also, if you want to follow me on stories on Instagram, it's Jack Howard Color, C-O-L-O-R, the American way, not the English way. And on Facebook, it's Jack Howard Color, C-O-L-O-R. And my website is www.jackhowardcolor.com. Yeah.